Hello, and welcome back to Reflections on Investing with the Cornell Capital Group. Now, we've got a little longer reflections this time. We're going to cover some, I think, very interesting topics on passive investing, market efficiency, and counterexamples to market efficiency, such as the uh, behavior of the medallion fund. So let's get started. Last time we talked about the equilibrium condition for the market. And we said that the equilibrium condition is that all shares have to be held. So let's think of the, the market as one uh, point and all investors together as another point. So all investors as a group have to hold the market portfolio. Otherwise, we wouldn't have an equilibrium. So that means all investors as a group can never underperform or outperform the market. They are the market. That means that if individual investors are going to outperform the market, they have to do so at the expense of other investors who underperform the market. That seems like a problem. And it actually gets a little worse when we think in terms of the efficient market hypothesis. This was originally put forward by Gene Fama in 1970 and has attracted a great deal of attention ever since. But it's often misunderstood, so let me see if I can explain it. And I think it's easier to start by moving away from the stock market to something maybe more familiar to more people, which is betting on football games. And in the football betting market, the people who run it, the casinos in Las Vegas, for example, want to have an equal amount based on bet on each side. Then all they have to do is take the money from the losers, pull out their cut, and give the remainder to the winners. How do you make sure that equal amounts are bet on each side? You let the price adjust. And in the football betting market, the price is the point spread. So... To say that the football betting market is efficient in Professor Fama's sense amounts to saying that the point spread reflects the relative abilities of the two teams. In the case of the Super Bowl, for example, prior to the game, the 49ers were a two-point favorite. If you wanted to bet on the 49ers, you had to give two points. That indicates that the market as a whole thought that the 49ers were two points better. That turned out to be wrong. We're not saying that an efficient market is clairvoyant, just that the two-point differential, if the betting market was efficient, reflects the relative strengths of the two teams. Now, there's a way to test that efficient market hypothesis. That is, you go and collect data from football gamblers and see how often they beat the point spread. That is, they pick the winning team net of the spread. And if they can do so a good deal more than 50% of the time, that's an indication that they know more than the market and therefore the market can't be efficient because it's not reflecting everything that they know. Okay, with that background, let's go back to the stock market. What does it mean to say that the price of Apple computer is efficient? What it means is that the current price reflects properly all the future profits that Apple is expected to deliver, discounted back to their present value. So if you purchase Apple shares, you're doing so at a fair price and you'll only get the fair risk-adjusted rate of return for Apple. Now, suppose you think you can beat the market for Apple. What does that mean? What that means is that the current price of 179, in your view, is too high or too low. And if you're right, if you think it's too low, you can buy the stock. And as the market starts to realize that you were right, equivalent to betting on the Chiefs, you will make a profit in excess of the normal market return. The efficient market hypothesis, as put forth by Professor Palmer, says 
that investors cannot beat the market. By doing their analysis, they cannot achieve returns greater than the average risk-adjusted return. So, if you accept that, what should you do? The answer is buy a passive, highly diverse index fund, like an S&P 500 index fund. Vacation, and since you cannot pick any winners or losers, you may as well just buy everything at the then market price. And a lot of investors have chosen to do that. And some pundits, and even Warren Buffett says, I would recommend that to people. Of course, I don't do it, <laughs> Mr. Buffett. He thinks, Mr. Buffett, he thinks he can beat the market, but he doesn't think other people can, so he recommends a highly diversified index fund. So <clears throat> why shouldn't everyone buy a highly diverse index fund? Well, here we get into a contradiction. And I, I actually wrote a paper on this in early 1980s with Richard Roll, but two other financial economists, Sandy Grossman and Joe Stiglitz, wrote a, a better known one. But the, we all had the same basic idea, which is the market cannot be efficient. That is a contradiction. And here's why. What makes the market efficient is not some sort of natural process such as determines the, the seasons of the year. It's investors trying to find bargains, pushing and pulling, buying and selling with each other. <clears throat> if everyone just accepted the market and bought passively, how would prices be determined? Maybe Apple would drift down to $50. Well, you might say, that's an incredible bargain. But if we're all passive, we aren't going to act on it. So the result of the Grossman Stiglitz work was a theorem that says the market has to be sufficiently inefficient that sophisticated, hardworking, uh, detail-oriented investors can beat it. So the, the idea is the market's always struggling toward efficiency, but it can never get there because if it did, people would stop doing the research, and if they stopped doing the research, the inefficiency would increase. So <clears throat> what evidence do we have for inefficiency? Well, in uh, 2019, I wrote a paper on the Medallion Fund. The Medallion Fund was one started by Renaissance Technology, which is a high-tech investment firm founded by James Simon. And the performance of that fund was beating the market by a mile. Between the years of 1988 and 2018, a 30-year period when I had the data, Medallion Fund never had a down year. In fact, its worst year after 1990 was about 30%. During the stock market crash of 2001, it rose 56%. During the great financial crisis, it rose 74%. Over the whole 30-year period, it averaged 66%. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, Brad. If it averaged 66% and you put like a million dollars in at the beginning, you'd have many trillions by 2018. And you're right. There is something wrong there, and the medallion people were aware of it. They closed the fund. No one outside of the company could invest in it. And even people within the company couldn't take their profits and reinvest them. In other words, the people at Renaissance Technologies were aware that a strategy that beats the market cannot scale without limit. Eventually, it becomes so big that it affects the market prices and undoes the anomaly that they were exploiting. And in his most recent letter to investors, Warren Buffett made exactly this point. He stated that though in the early days, he was able to substantially beat the market and did so for many years, Berkshire Hathaway has grown so large that he has to make investments on the order of $50 billion to move the needle and there are not going to be massively mispriced companies trading for in excess of $50 billion. 
So he says that it will be very difficult for him to beat the market by very much. That, that, positive, that if he could start over and be a little tiny firm again, he thought he could do it. But at this scale, no. So what do we take away from all this? For the investor, you don't want to blindly accept market efficiency because that cannot be the equilibrium condition. But the market is highly competitive. So unless you think that you, are, you yourself or whoever you're operating with helping you invest can move the needle enough to take advantage of the inefficiencies, then you might consider buying a passive fund. But at Cornell Capital, we see a lot of problems with that. It's not directed. And there's one final issue that I'll leave you with. Buying a fund has the, a disadvantage that you cannot take account of what's called the tax timing option. If you buy all 500 stocks in the S&P 500 yourself, you can hold the winners and sell the losers in such a way as to avoid any tax obligation for a substantial period. If you buy the fund, you're going to have an obligation on the net gain over the entire fund. You can't take, a, 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 you can't take advantage of the tax timing option that comes with holding individual securities. Well, I know this has been a long reflection, it's much longer than our previous ones, but thinking a bit about the idea of market efficiency, what it means to you and why it can't be true in general are all very useful ideas for managing your investments going forward. This has been Reflections on Investing with the Cornell Capital Group. Thank you for joining us.